Somehow or other, by the grace of the illusory energy, Maya Shakti, we think that we are part of a civilization that has made advancement and progress. It may take some effort for some of you to deprogram yourselves out of this notion. Because you feel that you are surrounded by innovations and technology that increase the sense gratification like every society, every good society should do. Every good society should increase the sense of gratification. So it looks like conveniences have rained from the sky. Advancements have rained, have rained from the sky, making life more convenient and more pleasurable. Looks like that, doesn't it? But to the bhakti yogi, who has eyes trained with transcendental knowledge, you'll see a complete disaster. That complete disaster can only be appreciated if you know what is the goal of life, particularly the goal of this human form of life. When I'm speaking at outreach events, I often deal with the prevalent concept that life is just a happening. We don't know where life came from. We don't know how things have come together like this. But that's not the point. The whole point is have some enjoyable moments. Try to squeeze as much pleasure as you can out of life. What happened before your birth? What happened after your death? Who knows? And we're not even thinking about that. It's just be part of the happening, you know? Just be with the scene. Like one devotee's parent told me when she was visiting <coughs> the devotee. She said, you know, you just, life is just like a divine flow. You just go with it, you know? And you trust in it. Sounds very profound, yes? <laughs> just trust in the divine flow. Just go with it. But what does that actually mean? What is the flow of life? Who can say? The flow of life means birth, growth, maintain for a while, produce some offspring, diminution, and that's it. That, 
that's the flow that you want to trust in and just go with it. But it sounds good, doesn't it? Just go with that flow, just trust in life. The processes of material nature are not for you to trust in, because whether you trust them or not, they're going, they're happening. <laughs> Do you trust in birth, death, disease, and old age? <laughs> Whether you trust in it or not, it's happening. <laughs> the flow of nature is happening. So I often have to explain that one of the most expert creatures at going with the flow. They're not human beings, they're animals. Animals are the most expert at trusting in life and going with the flow. So people are astonished when I go, <laughs> Because saying like this kind of punctures a bubble. Just trust in life. Maybe many of you would have said such a thing, right? Just trust in life, just go with the divine flow. Mm. Be in the zone as much as you can. Find some meaningful activity, no matter what it is so that you can just lose yourself in that activity. Get that feeling of like being at one with the music. Maybe many of you at rave clubs had that feeling assisted by various <laughs> chemical substances. <laughs> you had that feeling you were at one with the music, right? That's supposed to be the peak attainment. <laughs> Those moments in which you lose track of time and you're just fully absorbed in whatever you're doing, no matter what it is. So this is what many consider the best that life has to offer. I was just reading a statement today put forth as a memorable quotation. A quotation that should be immortalized Everyone should meditate on that. What was that quotation? The test of true enjoyment is the remembrance that it leaves behind. <laughs> Deep. <laughs> this is a celebrated is a celebrated quotation for today. <laughs> The test of true enjoyment is the remembrance that it leaves behind. Now, of course, an intelligent person would think, well, why does the enjoyment have to go? And so we're simply left savoring the memory. Why can't the enjoyment stay? No, don't think like that. <laughs> Just trust in life, go with the flow. Of course, so many of you heard the story I tell about my father telling me the goal of life was to leave some tracks in the sand when you're gone. You heard me say this. And of course, being an honest 14 year old, I asked him, but where do you go when you're gone? <laughs> Never mind the tracks, but where, when you're gone, where do you go? Son, son, you've missed the point. The <laughs> point is the tracks in the sand. <laughs> I was like, but I want to know, where do you go when you're gone? got very flustered. And I said, and what about those tracks in the sand? After a while, the waves come and wash them away, and the wind blows them away. Oh, you're just, yeah, over-intelligent, do It's the fault of your mother teaching you how to read when you were three. <laughs> so, similarly, the test of true enjoyment is the remembrance it leaves behind. Is that as good as it gets? But yes, people are convinced of that. Have some pleasant memories. And if you criticize that, it sounds cruel, doesn't it? Come on. Give us a break, you know. Lighten up. I mean, really. Life is, you know, it's tough enough sometimes. Uh, just, you can either look at the glass and see it's half full or half empty. See joy everywhere. Yes. Through the eyes of bhakti yoga, you will see joy everywhere, but not in 
the ordinary flow of material nature. Just like there are two rivers. One is polluted. The other is crystal clear. Which flow of the river do you want to go with? If you tell me you don't want to go with the flow of the toxic river, should I criticize you? You're just being negative. You see beauty everywhere. Just come on, dive in. <laughs> you would never do that. If I say to you, you have a choice between going with the flow of the toxic river, going with the flow of the fresh, clean river, you always choose to dive into the fresh, clean river and go with that flow. So Krishna and Bhagavad Gita is trying to educate us what material nature is doing. How can we live in a so-called human society that doesn't give people this basic knowledge? That you're not meant to trust in material nature. You're meant to rebel. <laughs> so bhakti yoga is the process of rebelling against material nature. <clears throat> It's a rebellion that the source of material nature wants you to do. <laughs> As Krishna says, This material nature is acting under my direction. So even though the material nature is Krishna's energy, and he's orchestrating it, he wants you to rebel against it. And he gives you all help for the revolution. <laughs> But we're such fools. No, let me remain enslaved. <laughs> let me remain a slave of material nature. That's advancement. That's progress. And when you analyze all the various innovations, you always find that for every step forward, there's a step backwards. For every so-called good thing, there's always some inconvenience, some negative factor created. Sooner or later it always comes out, if not immediately. The intelligent person then begins to wonder, what kind of setup is this? <laughs> this is Sanatana Goswami asking Lord Chaitanya. Who am I? Why must I suffer from the miseries of material existence? So our point is that a real human society is not there until people ask that question. What is interfering with me and why? Why can't I have peace? Why can't the world have peace? Why do crazy things happen? Why is there always some disturbance? I walk outside and a sand fly bites me. Why? <laughs> you all take sand flies for granted, but I remember if you're new to this country or just visiting, your Indian system is not accustomed to bite of a sand fly, and so you're. Remember when I first got bitten the first few times by a sand fly, arms swell up, and then your Indian system gets used to it. Why? Why does this happen? Now most people say, hey, you know, it's just the way it is, you know, just put on some repellent and you're safe. Put on some chemicals, you're safe. <laughs> DDT or whatever. <laughs> what are they called? DEET? DEET? Yeah, real strong jungle stuff. Jungle formula. <laughs> then you know you're safe. <laughs> Kills the bugs and you too. <laughs> you can go down the list for everything about so-called technological innovations and advancement. We do use such innovations for Krishna's service, but we're not blind. We don't think that these advancements are a pure step forward for society with no negative ramifications. So Sanatana Goswami's inquiries to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Chaitanya Charitamrita are demonstrating 
how a real human society should function. Why are there these disturbances? Whether it's just a sand fly, a mosquito, or anxieties, of any type, why is that there? It's the duty of the human being to ask that question. It's not idle luxury. Whether you're so-called rich, so-called pure, poor, or so-called intelligent, or not intelligent by ordinary standards, why am I being interfered with? And of course, the ultimate interferers are birth, death, disease, and old age. We hear it so many times, the older <coughs> devotees. You hear it all the time. You regularly read Bhagavad Gita, which everyone should. The point is constantly brought up to you. Birth, death, disease, and old age are all, mi are all misery. Try to think about that. Like I was looking at some of our lady devotees. They're expecting. They're, you know, they're being... <laughs> careful, careful. <laughs> My mother warned me about one thing when I was 11 years old. Does anyone remember? I never had a chance to use the advice, but she was carrying my youngest brother when I was 11. And so I, she was, you know, in the advanced stages. So I kind of one day just, ha, ha, ha. She gave me such a dirty look. You know, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> you better never forget it. When your time comes, and, and you have a family, just never make a funny remark about a pregnant woman. <laughs> never had a chance to use advice, but I didn't forget. <laughs> so, battery's out. It's going. It's blank. Oh, that's right. Have to change microphones. try to speak anyway. <laughs> sound for also the projector.
All right, I'll try to. So I was speaking about our ladies who are expected. And naturally, there's the joy of anticipation. The other ladies are congratulating. The men are telling the husband, well done, well done. <laughs> But what is the life like for that child in the room? Do you think about that? What is life to be in that situation? To your ordinary vision, you don't see anything. You just see a big belly. But what's going on inside there? You don't see the acute suffering. of a human being packed up like that. Back arched like a bow. Congratulations. <laughs> you don't see that. Because you don't see, you think everything is fine and peaceful, right? Just because you don't see. You don't see a child in such a painful situation that the child is crying out. It's a supreme controller. Please, when I get out, I'll dedicate my life in connection to you. You don't see all that happening. Similarly, unless you've been very, very sick, how many of you here have been very, very sick? Raise your hand. You don't really know because you can't remember what it's like to be just so sick. You're literally sick out of your mind. And then you don't remember old age until it happens to you. And of course, death. From the external point of view, it looks like there's such a thing as a peaceful death. One minute, he or she was breathing. The next minute, he or she stopped. But you don't see what's going on inside. This whole so-called advanced society is based on ignorance. Never mind the external ornamentations of so-called technological progress. The, in terms of the most essential ingredients of a real civilization, they're all missing. So we've been totally, <laughs> more than brainwashed, we've been, <laughs> it's a term, I don't know if you use it in this country. Bushwhacked? Anyone know what the term bushwhacked means? It comes from like someone walking through the jungle and then from behind a tree, someone's waiting and you're not, you don't know what's coming and they just whack you over the head. <laughs> it's called bushwhacked. <laughs> so that's what's going on. And we call that advancement, progress. Another point you can say is that, well, in some countries, people live a more comfortable life and they live longer. I think she won't mind me telling this. Sarup Shakti, when I first met her, I was doing a university program at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. And Shrub Shakti and there were some other students there. They're from Botswana, a little tiny country north west of South Africa. So they were interested. They came up after the program to ask me questions. And so I invited them over to the Cape Town Center for a discussion later that day. But I didn't know anything about Botswana. 
So I looked it up. What is Botswana? How is life there? And I saw that the average life expectancy for Botswana is 35 years. So when they came over to see me, I was ready. <laughs> How old are you guys? <laughs> oh, 20, 21. Do you realize that according to the average life expectancy of your country, you've got 14 more years to live? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we know that. <laughs> so you might say, well, how can anyone live like that? But people do. So you would say, oh, thank God it's not like that in New Zealand. <laughs> All right, so you live till 75 years or so. Still, from the overall point of view, death is there. But you say, no, no, but our death comes 40 years later. <laughs> Isn't that something? Come on, feel proud. Our death is 40 years later than Botswana. Wow, how advanced. Yes, wouldn't you think that? But is it negative or is it more intelligent to say that from the overall point of view, the same problem is still there? Is that being negative? That's being very wise. All right, you may say certain countries are backwards. People used to say that about India until India took over the IT world. Even the CEO of Microsoft now is India. <laughs> but you could say compared to life in the villages where there's not good medicine, not good hospital facilities, people can die quickly. Whereas here they die you know, after a longer time. This is progress. So yes, we can give some credit to modern medicine for prolonging life, and we can also give credit to modern medicine for destroying life. My middle brother, he's a doctor. Uh, he told me, he said, you know, when I'm dying, Please promise me one thing. Never take me to a hospital. <laughs> you simply become more sick there. He knows what goes on. <laughs> oh, but that's, you know, that's just one person saying like that. He's just, he's just being tongue-in-cheek. He's just being ironic. <clears throat> We've been blinded, bushwhacked, so we actually can't see straight. And then we get proud. Our society has a death rate of 75 years. Botswana has a death rate of 35 years. <laughs> but Srila Prabhupada taught us to reject all that. Why die? I mean, why die? <laughs> it happens. Why should it happen? I mean, why should it happen? The whole point is to have some good memories. <laughs> the test of true enjoyment. It's a remembrance that it leaves behind. <laughs> so can you see that actually Bhagavad Gita is totally transforming our worldview. It's going deeper than any ideological, theological transformation. It's actually changing your standpoint, your foundation. So we spoke about how, especially here in New Zealand, because there's no theistic or religious sugarcoating in New Zealand, the basic proposition is that, you know, life is kind of a happening, you know? We're just part of it. We don't know what the foundation is. We don't know what the source is, but that's not the point. The point is, have those magic moments in magic spots. <laughs> with magic people. <laughs> Leave it at that. 
Krishna talks about this in Bhagavad Gita. Asatyam apatishtam te jagadatura Those who have a depraved mentality, they say, this world's not real. It has no foundation. It has no cause. Meanwhile, while everyone says all that, or if they don't say it, they act like that, they're busy trying to enjoy the happening. So on the one hand, oh, it's just like a dream, you know, it's just something that comes from where we don't know and goes where we don't know. It's just life, you know, life. <laughs> and meanwhile, everyone's trying to squeeze out of every moment as much enjoyment as they can. I remember speaking to one relative. She was, in, she was an education professional. She was in charge of a school district in New York City. She was in charge of the Brooklyn School District. Two million students. So one day I asked her, I said, where do you come from? And what was her answer? What do you mean, where do I come from? I come from my mother and father. That was it. So we have a lot of educational work to do. We're not speaking religion here in the ordinary sense, religious sentiment. We're not speaking about that. We're speaking about education, culture, applied spiritual technology, transformation. The way a genuine bhakti yogi looks at the world is completely different. We know what the standard of a real civilization is. So remember, Sanatan Goswami's approach to Lord Chaitanya. We'll be speaking about that more starting tomorrow morning. He asks, who am I? Why am I suffering from the miseries of material life? If I don't know these answers, how can I benefit myself? And what is the outlook of our current society? If you try to find out the answers, you'll never be able to benefit yourself. <laughs> Get on with it, having a good time, mate. <laughs> it's, life is just a happening. No foundation. It's like a dream. Just get your share of the pleasure like everyone else is getting. And be a bit charitable. Help others to enjoy. Give some enjoyment to others. Nice. And if you're an advanced human being, when you help to distribute material enjoyment, don't discriminate in terms of gender, ethnicity. That's the New Zealand standard. No discrimination in terms of sense gratification. <laughs> equal to all. Everyone has an equal chance to be in Maya. <laughs> So please think about this. To reinforce this point, we have some video clips for you. <clears throat> and again, I ask for your compassion upon this situation and persons caught in such mass ignorance because except for Lord Titani and his representatives, we would also be in that mass illusion. It is the potency of the Hare Krishna mantra that purifies your consciousness so you can see out of this trap. This is not religious sentiment. We're talking about educational transformation. One minute you're seeing one way, you take up the applied spiritual technology, you see another way. You know the famous statement by Shukadeva Goswami in Second Canto Bhagavatam. Pashyanapi na pashyati. As Sanskrit means, you see, but actually you don't see. Or, paraphrase another way, you're sufficiently experienced, but still you do not see. 
You've experienced so many material lifetimes in so many different bodies. But still you don't see what's going on. And now you have the human body, you can rebel. You've got to try as a human being to seize this opportunity with your advanced intelligence to solve the mystery of why am I being interfered with? Why am I suffering? It's not intelligent just to tolerate. Intelligence means to get to the root of the problem. When you look at these video clips, just think. Easily you could be in the same situation. And there are billions of persons in this situation. How are we going to help them? If we're actually going to be effective and dynamic in genuinely helping others, we have to understand what is real human progress. What's a real human society? Genuine bhakti life is not materialism with some kind of religious sentiment smeared on top. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is a completely different standpoint. It is a completely different foundation. The bhakti yogi sees this human body as an opportunity that cannot be missed. All right, let's see the perpetual one.
most of the medications that they've given me are adverse. Again and again, I've been handed a product with Tylenol, a known liver destroyer, but the medical people just give it to me because that's what they were told to do. Whoever told them to do it is a diabolical motherfucker. <laughs> Jen and I are pretty like-minded, so we have that bond. I'd say at this point in my life, I'm much closer to having those moments of joy, having what I want, in a sense. My needs are small, that helps, and they're more attainable. Being here with a woman that cares if I live or die, and it's warm at night, and it's blessed. These people don't have nothing like I have. Okay, I'm gonna die, but tonight I've got my guitar and I'm with some people and things are going well. Sometimes things make me cry, but I think it's more the beauty that I see in the loss. It would be ideal to me if when I'm gone and someone thinks about me, that they smile and remember something good about me, what a good time we had. So for most, People doesn't get any better than that. It says, hey, I hope that after I'm gone, some people might remember me with a smile. The amazing thing, which is hard for us to accept right now, is that in 100 years, we're all gonna be forgotten. I wonder if you ever think about that. We take our daily struggles, we take our daily personal crises so seriously, but the fact is, uh, in a hundred years, we won't even be history. <laughs> I often tell the story from the Ninth Canto of Bhagavatam about Kukudbi. He wanted to find a qualified husband for his daughter. So he wanted to hear it from the topmost authority in the universe. He wanted the topmost recommendation from the topmost authority. So with his mystic power, he was able to go to Brahmaloka, the planet of Lord Brahma. He got there, and Lord Brahma was listening to a concert performed by the Gandharvas. The Gandharvas are sub-demigods in Sanskrit, upadevas, near demigods. But their thing is expertise and music, singing, dancing. Nothing on earth, no earthly music or artistic expression can compare to the Gandharas. So, Brahma was absorbed in hearing a concert on Brahma Lok. So when Kukudmi said to, tried to approach him, Brahma said, I have to finish listening to the concert first. When the concert was over, Kukudmi made his presentation. Uh, I'd like you to recommend someone for marrying my daughter. Brahma looked at him and laughed. Said, Don't you know, in the period of time that you've been waiting for the concert to end, which was for Brahma on his time cycle, it was about a half hour. Hmm. But on Earth, 
Brahmatol, don't you understand? <laughs> All your sons are gone. The children of your sons are gone. The grandchildren of your sons are gone. There's not even a memory of them. Time has moved on. So Brahma advised him. There's no one on earth who you know. They've all long gone, generation after generation. They've passed on. No one even remembers them. But, he said, you want the best husband for your daughter. Why was his daughter preserved? Because she's the eternal consort of the one she's going to marry. Brahma said, marry her to Balaram. <laughs> so, Kukudmi went back down to the earth planet and sure enough he found there was no symptoms even of where he used to live. So he found Lord Balaram and gave his daughter to Balaram. Of course, Balaram's entourage is eternal. But the point is, <laughs> we take our material selves so seriously. But in a short time, even if people want to, they won't remember us. And if you take another material body, you won't even remember what you did in this body. Sometimes people challenge. If we had a last life, a previous life, how come we can't remember? Anyone ever presented that to you? If you had a previous life, how come you don't remember? <laughs> well, can you tell us exactly what you did at every moment two days ago? What's this thing about remembering? <laughs> you can't even remember what you did exactly yesterday. In other words, material life is based on forgetfulness. Ignorance, in other words. So it is the greatest lack of human progress for someone to get with his body as poor Ed did. Yeah, I'm a negativist, you might say. Anything positive is just, you know, just a scam. Got a woman who thinks just like I do. <laughs> Whether I live or die makes a difference to her. Yeah, I've got some weeks left. Had some good memories, some warm nights. Yeah. There was a time when that would have made sense to so many of you. Does it get any better than that? Hey, do what you can do, you know? Trust in the universe, whoever takes you. Ignorance gets worse. That's the problem. Ignorance does not stay at a stable level. The material energy, the illusory energy, is dynamic. It's dragging. So the bewilderment increases. You cannot trust the illusory energy to just stay put, so to speak. All right, just let me be in this amount of illusion. <laughs> and don't cover me anymore. Don't bewilder me any more than the, the current status quo. We often explain the submarine theory. Everyone remembers the submarine theory? Sometimes when our practitioners get a bit slack, they think that the illusory energy will treat them like the ocean treats a submarine. I'll just go down 10 meters below the surface, 10 meters into illusion, hold it right there, like a submarine. <laughs> and then I think I'll go down maybe 20 meters, but I'll hold it right there. <laughs> and each time the illusory energy 
says, you'll be all right. You, you'll hold it 10 meters. You'll hold it 20 meters. It's all up to you. <laughs> You're the master of your fate. And because illusion energy is cheating, bewildering, when you're least expecting it, you're dragged all the way down to the bottom. Often this happens when devotees slack off on their chanting. No, nothing's happened to me. No lightning bolt has hit me. And they don't perceive how gradually their vision is being transformed back to a material vision. And by not taking shelter of the Maha Mantra, you leave yourself wide open for an eventual captivation by the illusory energy. So what we're trying to explain tonight is how the standpoint, the foundation of a bhakti yogi is completely different. From the individual point of view and from the social point of view. We see society in a completely different way. We don't see great advancement. We don't see great progress. We see a situation in which people will not try to use the great opportunity of the human form of life. They won't question, why am I suffering? What's the, what's the root cause of it? This is an example set by Samantha Goswami. He's an eternally liberated soul, but he's putting himself in our position to teach us. So he asked Lord Chaitanya, who am I? Why am I suffering these unwanted things? If I don't know the answer to these questions, how can I truly benefit myself? And what does so-called advanced society tell you? If you don't know the answers to these questions, good on you. <laughs> You'll be all right. <laughs> You'll enjoy. You'll have some moments. Illusion is not stable and inert. It's in motion, so to speak. It's dynamic. Things become more and more covered over, dark, bewildered. We're going to see in our next video clip the logical extension of materialistic consciousness. In other words, if everything is matter and the world has no foundation, life is just a happening, then certain conclusions become automatic. So we're going to see a documentary, a true documentary about someone in Belgium. I don't think we have anyone here from Belgium. Janice Free's not here. So. There, you can legally end your life. You can, euthanasia is legal, not simply for health reasons, but also for the, your own reason that you can't cope with life anymore. You feel life is too painful, you can opt out. Now just think, if you, if from the material point of view, what's so illogical about this? Like Shesha Prabhu was telling me today. Abortion means it's the woman's rights, her, her rights over what's, what her body does. Similarly, the euthanasia, even for someone who's not physically ill, is the right of the person. If they want, it, they want out, they want out. This is progress. This is enlightenment. It's your body. It's, it's your happening amidst the random flux of happening. If you want to random out, that's, that's your business. <laughs> Just make sure you know what you're doing and that it's your choice. So yes, this sounds shocking. I would look at me like. But think, if you are a materialist, it all adds up, right? What does it matter if everything is just matter? Abortion doesn't matter. 
So, similarly, euthanasia, even for more than terminal illness. Why not? It's up to you. The power is in your hands. How are you going to relate to this dream world? So let's watch. Otherwise, you wouldn't believe that such a thing could happen. Let us watch with compassion. Hello, I'm Emmy. I'm 24 years old and I'm from Belgium. And this documentary is about my request for euthanasia because of mental suffering. And when you see this documentary, I, I won't be here anymore. The right to die may be a complex moral principle, but is it also a basic human right? How we end our lives has become one of the most challenging and controversial questions of our time. When it comes to doctor-assisted dying, Belgium has the most liberal laws in the world. This is Emily's story. From the outside, She's a physically healthy young woman, with a loving family and friends. It appears Emily has everything to live for, but she finds her life unbearable. dat mijn wens eigenlijk was om te sterven. Voor mij die video maken was een stukje laagdrempeliger dan het tegen begeleiding te gaan vertellen waarmee naar buiten komen met mijn doodswens. I can't even look forward in, in time because I can't picture myself anywhere in what kind of position, wherever, whoever, I don't, I don't see it at all. Op het moment dat je zo kwetsbaar bent, dus dat is moeilijk om terug te zien. Als ik dat vergelijk met nu, toen was ik nog zo zoekend naar hoe ik heel mijn doodsvang scanbaar kon maken om de ring. En... Emily has been getting psychological treatment since she was 12 years old. After a series of suicide attempts, she was committed to a psychiatric clinic two years ago. She now lives between the clinic and her apartment in Bruges. So that's my medication problem. I have been stocking supplies to take care of the wounds I have. <coughs> this one is an advantage, and this one. But this arm is uh, better than that one, so. When was the last time you harmed yourself? It was this arm and uh, I think it's four or five days ago, but I do it less now because it doesn't give me enough like it, like it used to. In 2013, there were more than 1,800 doctor-assisted deaths in Belgium. While 97% of cases involved people suffering terminal or chronic physical illness, 3% were people suffering psychiatric disorders. The most extreme and controversial form of assisted suicide. Belgium is one of only two countries that allow it. 
strict criteria have to be met before doctor-assisted death is allowed. Emily's case has to go through dozens of medical professionals and ultimately be signed off by three doctors, one of whom the psychiatrist, Dr. Lever Tienpont. Vi vill ta hjälp av mig det som man sett i sig med för att de de vill bespråka sig. Vi har med allt det här att vi kan är det destruktivitet och vi är seriöst du vet nu. Emily started her application to end her life nearly two years ago. Den går till mesta av om inte så här eller alla människor med en utanansinfråg på basis av psykiskt liv har det en lång förhåll från psykiskt liv. Dus dat is helemaal verschillend van iemand die een, een acute depressie doet, bijvoorbeeld naar aanleiding van een rouw. Dat is juist de inschatting van de artsen hè, en de drie artsen die met de patiënt bezig zijn. Hè, want binnen psychiatrie, de, de mogelijkheden zijn oneindig. Hè. Medicatie, combinatie van medicatie met ambulante residentiële therapieën kunnen we verder doen. Maar het moeten eerlijke kansen zijn waarvan we echt weten dat het perspectief kan bieden. En bij sommige mensen hebben we die nu, zoals we dat... En in sommige kankersituaties ook niet meer hebben, is dat ook zo bij psychisch lijden. Soms hebben we niet meer, uh, niks meer te bieden. Emily's faced a lifelong battle with extreme depression and complicated psychiatric disorders. I think that al heel jong is begonnen. I think that three years of zoals. I liep naar school aan de hand van mijn opa en ik dacht ik wil hier niet lopen. Ik wil hier niet zijn. Why is it so difficult when it comes to mental illness for people to understand it? Ik denk dat er verschillende redenen zijn, maar soms vergelijk ik bijvoorbeeld kanker, hè, omdat we dat allemaal goed kennen. Kanker kan je, kan je vastleggen op foto. Hè. Je kan dat zien op een röntgenfoto of een scan en je ziet de vijand. Bij psychisch lijden hebben we niks dat we kunnen objectiveren, vastleggen. Het, ja, ik denk het feit dat we het niet kunnen objectief vastleggen in beeld brengen, dat dat eigenlijk het moeilijkste van allemaal is. It's now been decided by a panel of three doctors that Emily's application for an assisted death can finally go ahead. Her family and friends will have to come to terms with the fact she will soon be gone. Fearing a possible public backlash after Emily's death, her mother does not want her face to appear in this film. As a mother, how do you cope? In the beginning of the process, I, I, I try to motivate her, contact with other psychiatric hospitals or other ideas, and she said, Mama, please stop, because you will lose me if you keep doing this. The only way I can help her is by being there for her and her accepting is not a real word, but go along with it. It's the only way I can help my daughter. And I, 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 I want to be there for her till the end and I want to be her mother. None of the medical interventions seem to have improved Emily's condition, so she's consistently resorted to self-harm. It feels always as if there is a monster behind my ribcage that has not been cleaned up, and with the snaring and the feeling of, okay, you can do it a little bit there, and with the head bonking, and with the more feeling of, okay, I can do it again, slaying, bonking, mapping, but that stops not again. Dan die traan te dromen, want vaak lijkt het bijna in plaats van mijn traan om dan te zeggen ik sta recht en ik doe weer door. Ik heb een fucking goed met goede nodig en ik denk dat dat het zwaarste is om iedere keer terug opnieuw te gaan recht staan en iedere keer terug opnieuw verder te doen terwijl dat je weet 
dat een uur later, vijf minuten later, het maakt niet uit, dat er terug is. En dat je door heel hetzelfde ritueel moet gaan. En dat is wat dat zo ondraaglijk maakt, want je kunt iedere keer blijven opstaan, maar als je iedere keer aan elkaar staat, dan snel het opvolgt en je raakt je gevoel net als in kwijt. Emily's received the news she's been waiting for. A date has been set. She's meeting with her doctors to discuss the practicalities of ending her life. So where are we going, Emily? Ik ga nu naar Klebenzuis om consultatie naar nieuwe tabletten. In Belgium, patients who wish to end their lives can choose to drink a lethal liquid or receive a lethal injection from a doctor. Emily is opted for the injection. Op de dag van de uitvoering komen we in. En er zullen nog andere mensen aanwezig zijn, heb je verteld. Dus dat is voor ons toch van belang. En eerst gaan we opnieuw spreken. We bellen opnieuw. Zowel met u als met uw vriendinnen, uw mama als ze daar is. Aan u vragen we heel expliciet nog een keer. We willen iets echt, echt, echt. Tot het laatste ogenblik kun je dus nee zeggen, dat is van belang. Dat doet ons ook altijd wel niet. Ja, dan gaan we een stukje mee gaan. Dus dat wil zeggen dat we, als dan, als we ook een afscheid nemen van dat ik ook. Maar je kunt tot het laatste ogenblik kun je nee zeggen. Zelfs om een strategetje al zit, kun je nog nee zeggen. Ja, en heel, heel belangrijk vind ik daarin dat je weet dat als je plaats met je neen zegt, dat dat je geloofwaardigheid niet aan bent gehouden. Nee, absoluut. Maar dat weet ik heel goed uit. Want zo'n plaats naar die afschrik. En het eerste spuitje dat je krijgt, brengt je weer slag. Dat is lekker in de achterlaas. Van dat moment weet je niks meer. Van dat moment is het verloop in je achterlaas. Want jij weet niks meer. En dan volgen de andere spuitjes. Uh, die het overlijden tot de ja. Die hele procedure van die spuitjes, dat duurt vijf minuten. En het overlijden is even binnen de vijf of tien minuten gepasseerd. Ja. Emily's case has reignited national debate over how far Belgium's assisted dying law should go. Some medical professionals support the right to die in principle, but dispute its use for mental suffering. You have to um, establish in, an, uh, in some ways that the uh, mental illness is not curable. For most of the mental illnesses, it is not established that they are incurable or that the suffering they cause is untreatable. A lot of patients actually go better, you know? We all have moments of Black, 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 uh, uh, desperate thoughts. But most of us go on living. So no, I know there are serious conditions which, in which it is worse. But that, that doesn't preclude that they could be helped also. You must yourself with the people speak. If you don't speak with yourself, then kan je niet begrijpen waar dat lijden zit en waarom het ondraaglijk is of wordt. Dat is een zeer moeilijk aanvaardingsproces. Telkens opnieuw. Haar ziektetoestand is zo ernstig dat, we dus, dat blijkt dat het niet levensvatbaar is. Daarmee bedoel ik dat het leidt tot een leven dat voor Emily niet kwaliteitsvol genoeg is. With the date of her euthanasia just two weeks away, Emily's meeting with her best friends, Franke and Lisa, to discuss her funeral.
Emily's asked her friends if they could say a few words at the ceremony. Merci. Voor mij is het belangrijkste dat je voor jullie goed aanvoelt en dat je kunt zeggen wat je wilt zeggen uiteindelijk. Ik vind dat het belangrijkste. Ja, ik voel mij dat eigenlijk ook dat er in de periode dat nu gepasseerd is, of dat er geen moment is geweest dat je zegt van ik stop ermee, um, ik wil er toch nog voor gaan. Is er geen enkel moment geweest dat je dat toch eventjes had? Ik had liever een draagbaar leven gehad dan, dan het sterven als ik. Dus een echte twijfel, ik denk een grootste twijfel zit hem in het moment van afscheid nemen. Emily's friends live in the hope that she might still change her mind. Of the first 100 people in Belgium to apply for the right to end their lives on the grounds of mental suffering, 48 were accepted. 11 of those subsequently decided to postpone or cancel the procedure. Emily's procedure is just four days away. She's getting her affairs in order. Die bokaal met stenen van Fulken en mij en uh, op de eerste dag dat we elkaar leren kennen, waren we gaan wandelen en toen kwamen we deze stenen tegen. En we noemen ze de Moon Rocks, omdat ze precies maankraters zijn. En ik heb die tot nu toe altijd gespaard. Dus als ik er niet meer ben, dan gaat deze bokaal naar Fulken als herinnering van onze eerste ontmoeting. En de televisie. Die gaan naar mijn mama, want mijn mama heeft nu nog zo'n oude breed, zo'n oude televisiebak. Ik zeg niet geloven, dus ik, ik geloof niet dat er een bepaald iets is. Maar ik denk dat het vooral gaat over waar je voor jezelf rust in vindt. Kun je jezelf angst gaan aanpraten of angst gaan inruimen, maar dan kun je even goed een idee voor ogen houden van het zal zo zijn dat je rust brengt. Als dit dan als ieder niet was, dan had ik na al die jaren of zien ook nog een keer op een vrolijke en eenzame en pijnlijke manier een eind moeten maken aan mijn eigen leven. Ben ik zeker dat ik zelf moet dat gepleegd. Emily spends her last day saying her goodbyes. The euthanasia is scheduled for five o'clock in her apartment. Froke, Lisa, ze kwamen binnen en ze vroegen mij, wat ga je doen? Ga je doorgaan? Ik kon nog geen antwoord geven. Een dokter Poot toekwam, was er nog een kort gesprek. En rationeel heb ik gezegd, ik kan het niet doen. Omdat de laatste twee weken voor 
de befaamde donderdag dat het zou gebeuren, die waren relatief draaglijk. Er waren geen crisissen. En voor mij was het heel onduidelijk hoe dat, dat kwam. Is dat omdat de rust nabij was en omdat we afscheid aan het nemen waren, dat het daardoor oké okay was? Of is er toch iets veranderd? Is er toch iets bij mij binnengeslopen dat het terug een beetje draaglijker maakte? Het feit dat de mensen de toestemming krijgen hè, om te sterven of hulp te krijgen bij het sterven, maakt voor een aantal mensen dat er rust komt, relatieve rust. De geruststelling dat er een nood hen is, dat zij kunnen beslissen wanneer het echt te veel wordt, helpt hen om verder te doen. Dus ik heb geprobeerd om zo min mogelijk aan mijn waarheid te denken. En de waarheid is nog altijd voor mij dat ik er liever niet ben. Dus ik hou mijn hart een beetje vast voor de toekomst. Ik weet het niet. Belgium's controversial decision to give people like Emily the right to die has given some of them a chance to live. Around the world, there's an increasing acceptance of the idea that doctors should be allowed to assist the suffering and terminally ill to die when they choose. But as popular support grows, so does the debate over who should and who should not be granted the right to die. Okay, so what do you think? This is state of the art. State of the art human society. You have the right to opt out. She's feeling that somehow there will be peace by opting out. Those who have non-material knowledge understand you cannot opt out. As Krishna says, for one who has been born, death is certain, and for one who has died, birth is certain. So this idea that you can opt out materially is totally false. And in fact, the Vedas explain that by artificially trying to break out of prison, so to speak, you suffer even more. You cannot get out of the prison of material existence by illegal methods, just like if someone does a prison break. They're captured and they're punished even more. So similarly, the so-called peaceful death is an illusion created by persons who look from the outside. They can't see the inside, the consciousness. They don't see the suffering of the subtle body being separated from the gross body. Actually, every material death is a suicide in that the situation becomes so painful that the soul in the subtle body just rips itself out of the gross body. way as you've seen is total violation of the laws of nature and simply increases the suffering. Human life is meant for understanding how to make an actual solution to the problem. But because these psychiatrists, psychologists are steeped in material knowledge, they think that they are actually doing good. As you saw in the face of the psychologist or psychiatrist, the, the, the lady, she looked totally miserable. But 
these are persons who are making pronouncements from the standpoint of being learned, trained, and professional. I give them credit for understanding if everything is matter, then nothing matters. Matter has randomly come together, and matter is separating. They've taken the reductionist material conclusion to its extreme, logical extreme, to a, a devilish intelligence that makes sense. If we're just a pile of chemicals, what's the wrong in a pile of chemicals voluntarily deciding to disintegrate? So this is considered advancement. We want to view such situations with compassion. These situations are due to a lack of genuine wisdom and knowledge. What is a prominent feature of a depraved society? Not that they don't have this religious belief or they have that religious belief. <laughs> Not like some ISIS Taliban worldview. No. The difference between a depraved society and a progressive society is that a progressive society follows guidelines for purification. Whereas a depraved society thinks you can do whatever you like. It's all up to your whims. You want to kill yourself? As long as you go through a body of learned experts, <laughs> it can happen. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Dra Bhuta Saga Lokes Min Daiva Asri. Divine and depraved. So, what's the difference between the two? Does one look ugly, the other look beautiful? <laughs> They're depraved to have horns coming out of their head or something. <laughs> the simple difference is no matter whether they're ugly or beautiful in terms of physique, whether they're intelligent or not in terms of material intelligence, the only difference is one follows regulations for purification, the others doesn't. That's the only difference. One acts according to whims, do what you like, be happy in your own way, follow your bliss, however you define it. Like the advice parents these days often give their children, just be happy in your own way, that's all we want. Follow your idea, your whim. In this way, the parents totally offload their responsibilities for any higher direction. In one sense, it's honest because they don't know anything, so why put themselves in the position of speaking from a higher platform? There's no higher platform. You'll follow your senses just like we followed our senses. <laughs> We're, the parents are true to their sense gratification, the children should also be true to their sense gratification. That's what life's all about. So we protest this kind of so-called civilization. It's a very serious situation. That even such a phenomenon can be a law, and even that there's a debate about it, it's happening. <coughs> the narrator explained there are two countries where this is legal. I don't know the other one. Anyone know? Besides Belgium? Anyone from Europe here who knows? Netherlands. Huh? Netherlands. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, anything goes in the Netherlands. <laughs> right next door to Belgium, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's further up. Huh? It's further up. Belgium is uh, 
Right, thank you for the geography lesson. <laughs> <laughs> So seeing these things makes me think. I hope it does that for you. In other words, I'm asking you not to simply be like horrified or, oh, why are you horrified? What's the reason? In other words, if we don't have the knowledge and we're just responding with a gut reaction, where does that gut reaction come from? What's it based on? So therefore, the learned clinical psychologists and psychiatrists will argue with you. You may have your gut reaction, but these people are suffering. You don't know what it's like to be in their shoes. Mental agony. Give them peace. Give them relief. Give them out. So what do you base your gut reaction on? Oh, this is not, should not be done. Even in liberal New Zealand, we don't have such a law yet. So are we just responding based on a gut reaction? Or are we responding based on knowledge? That's the question. So, at least for me, this gives a lot to think about. How, how sentimental are we? And how much founded are we on, in transcendental knowledge, non-material knowledge? Because sentiment won't allow you to deal with such a situation. People will just say, that's your sentiment. What about me and my sentiments? It's my life. So hopefully these thinking exercises will help you. We don't mean to make you morose. The point is to get you to think deeply. How do you get peace? How do you get relief? I appreciate the girl's acceptance that she's struggling. Many people today won't accept that, but that's a subject for another night. Maybe next time we'll discuss, is life a struggle or not? You could definitely see that for her, she's struggling. Still the question is, isn't everyone struggling? But what is the definition of struggle when Krishna says, Manushastan in Riyani, Prakriti Stan in Karshati? You're struggling in the oppressive material atmosphere. What does that mean? You say, oh, right now I don't feel like I'm struggling. Nice day out. <laughs> So we have a lot of soul searching to do and a lot of changing our consciousness to understand what is the mission of the human form of life. Throw that mission out and then, yeah, do whatever you like. Everything is random. It's up to you, whatever you are, whatever that is. Live your life your way. Go with the divine flow, trust in life. There's nothing after death, or if there is, the universe will take care of you somehow. There's no life on other planets. All these folk beliefs, they're so much a part of so-called civilized society to it. So in the coming days, we'll be looking at more of the folk beliefs. But these are some of the themes that we discuss at outreach events. I often use these video clips to stir up cosmopolitan audiences like in Sydney and cities in the USA. And sometimes that's a loft and all that. People are so used to seeing everything on a screen, so when they see things like that, it makes a big impact. And then we discuss. I don't recommend, of course, that devotees spend their time on the 
internet searching for these kind of things. <laughs> Unless you know where to look, it'll take you many days to find these kind of things. I just happen to know where to look. I don't recommend it. Oh, Gumaraj, he does it. I get, I'll, just, yeah, I'll get on the internet and I'll see yes, yeah, many eight hours. I'll, yeah, it's, all, it's all there. No, it's all not there. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to know exactly where to look and where not to look. <laughs> Otherwise, the internet can be uh, quite a dangerous place, especially for the saffron set. <laughs> <laughs> Chandi does send me things, he knows where to look and where not to look. But it's not often that I find things like this. I just don't think like, wow, it's just all out there. And you just get on your computer and this stuff just falls out of the sky. No. <laughs> so I hope this was impactful for you in terms of the understanding, our understanding of what our foundation is. Is it religious sentiment and therefore we're responding, oh, how horrible. Or is it, are we responding from the viewpoint of transcendental knowledge and applied spiritual technology? In which, of which we know there's no material out. You can't bust out of jail. <laughs> it makes it worse if you try. You'll simply be recaptured and put back in worse situation. So if we're going to try to get out, you get out by spiritual methods. That's what this human form of life is meant for. Yes, get out of the cycle of repeated birth and death, but you can't do it materially. But if we say to someone, the mission of a human form of life to end your repeated birth and death. Oh, wow, that's nice. You believe in reincarnation, huh? <laughs> okay, good on you. <laughs> hey, whatever you want to believe in, you know? <laughs> anyway, here, have another beer. <laughs> or... If they're Indian, they'll say, hey, have another kingfisher. <laughs> We're in a very serious situation. At the same time, we have a right to be joyful. Because glorification of Krishna is joy. But that glorification of Krishna is not on the material platform. All the singing and dancing that you're doing is not a material activity. When you're absorbed in the chanting and dancing, you're actually out. <laughs> you're out of the cycle of Peter birth and death. Otherwise, how is it you can be just saying over and over again, Hare Krishna and Rama? You ever wonder how is it they can do that? Over and over again, Hare Krishna and Rama. Three words. They don't get tired and they, <laughs> they get more and more happy. It's because they're actually out of material existence by the virtue of the sound vibration. Maybe some of you can remember the first time you encountered Kirtan, the group chanting of the Maha Mantra. What were some of you thinking the first time? What were you thinking the first time? Uh, I think it was on Queen Street. Yeah. When I was working and I thought it was a kind of uh -huh. That's a nice cue, actually. Yeah, it's kind of nice. I respect them. <laughs> Not going to be one of them. <laughs> oh, the happy Haris. <laughs> nice. You know, they're happy, but they no practical solutions. Anyone else remember the first time you saw a Kirtan? Rasiatra? 
<laughs> why? Why do you think they're on drugs? Because I was so happy and, and I'm so, that I was so free. That and you knew that all the real happiness comes from. <laughs> <laughs> They thought they must be on drugs, yeah. Wait, most people wouldn't do that. Anyone else, Rev? Yes? Um, so the first Sunday I went to the loft and Guitar Valley was leading. And I just remember thinking this is just more beautiful than anything I've ever heard. Anyone else? Yes. Um, I was 12 years old and my school friend saw the Hare Krishna on the street and she told us and we concluded that they escaped the mental hospital. <laughs> 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 oh, they had shaved heads and they were wearing black like sheep. <laughs> And never did you think you would be. But do you I thought there was something that was different to everything I had heard before. I've been to lots of live music and drums and all that, but there was something special. I didn't know what it was. Anyone? Yes, Ashwananda. I was at Nivashan Temple. And uh, we just checked this uh, schedule and thought, oh, we've got like, the Sunday feast and see what this is all about. And so a friend of mine, Richard and I, we, uh, we went and uh, you know, got really tumultuous. We couldn't believe how intense and you know, did it the music was. And we played a lot of music and experienced a lot of music before. It was so intense. I mean, when are they going to stop? It's just, they just keep going. We were quiet. We were so <laughs> no, it's going. going, going. Funny story with Ashwananda. He was, who was the one who was, you were the first one who was thinking, my friends, if I ever meet them again, I'm sure they'd be into this. Is that you? How many was the two of them? Yeah. <laughs> His former friends, you know, he moved to another city. So then he became a devotee and he was thinking, my friends would really be into this. And then one year later, he was at a devotee event. And who did you see? Yeah, he's, he came. He, yeah, he came here. Hey, <laughs> one of my friends. <laughs> and then what? At the end of the year. So he was always thinking, yeah, my friends would be into this. Sometimes that happens, sometimes not. Of course, you know the story about Nandishpur and Sukhasindhi. Yeah? <laughs> Nandishpur brought Sukhasindhi to, to Bhakti. And so, they were in their late 20s at the time. So they were reminiscing one day. And Nandishra was saying, you know, when I was a little boy, eight years old or whatever, I was in Australia at a beach, and I was in the water, and I got carried away by a, a rip, and I, I was about to just drown. And then these, there were these other little boys there, about my age, and somehow they, they, they were able to pull me out of the water. So Sukha Sindhu was listening and said, uh, I remember that. That was me. <laughs> 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 True story. <laughs> so well, one saved the other materially, then the other came and saved him spiritually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sometimes <laughs> there are surprises in this material existence. So the kirtan changes the energy that you are situated in. The sound vibration changes your foundation, 
it changes every aspect of your existence. So much so that you seem to be in the material world, but actually you are absorbed in Krishna's spiritual energy. Any other realizations about watching this 24-year-old girl go through her existence? Yes? I think we need centers in every city and every town <laughs> because people don't have the alternative. <clears throat> Clinical psychotherapist, what is your? Well, yeah, I've worked with a lot of people that are suicidal and cutting and see no hope. And often it is a lack of understanding of philosophy or a lack of answers. And I've actually ended up having quite in depth conversations with people on that precipice um, to actually start questioning why and try and understand them. And it's okay to have to use intelligence and that kind of um, I guess from a clinical perspective, they obviously have a different way that they deal with it. Um, because statistically, she's only 24, there's, she's got a lot of, she's still going through growth and changes that she should get better over time anyway. Because it, so it's quite an interesting angle that those psychologists had there because she was so young. What would you call that angle? <laughs> um, well, yeah, yeah, it's not. I don't think that would be an internationally informed evidence base in terms of if they were allowing a 24 year old to take a life. But they said, the, 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 the academics say that this is that it's like they're being merciful because, as you heard, the, the explanation uh, every day for this girl is just like torture and. It's easy for you to say from the outside, but from, you know, what it's like for her from the inside. Well, you just did. Really, they obviously train quite differently. Because it's always about the psychology of trying new solutions, trying new things. And the latest evidence is that you need to live with your illness. So such a thing could never happen in New Zealand, right? Oh, no, it could. I mean, there's been a debate recently because there was a lawyer who wanted to take their life, so it's created a conversation. If you're a materialist, why not? The whole point of material life is to get as much happiness for yourself and escape as much distress for yourself. So why not pull the plug if it's just distress? And there's no religious sentiment in New Zealand. So you want to drop out of the happening? That's your business. Sachi Dural, you want to say? Gurudev, um, this, the latest psychological treatment, they call it uh, ACT, ACT and Commitment Therapy, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, and their conclusion is that uh, you can access the, a non-material part of you, which is just the observer, the witness, but then they just leave it at that, and, uh, and then they say, but unlike, you might find this similar to some Medit Eastern traditions, but unlike Eastern religious traditions, we don't place any expectations on this non-material awareness, and they kind of completely back out, and, and they just leave it at that, so I found that extremely... Sounds like some kind of quasi-Buddhist influence. Yes, I found that they come from Buddhism. You'll be in contact with the nothingness. You're not putting any value judgments on the nothingness. It's undefinable. It's just something out there. But yeah, it's the mindfulness. So it's the concept of that you, your life is changing, your mind is changing, and learning to just have peace with it. I recently was meeting with the head counselor at Victoria University. Sorry. Um, I was just recently meeting with the head counselor at Victoria University in Wellington, um, and he wants me to do some video work for next year. 
about depression and anxiety and sexual violence and all these problems for students. And um, and I was saying we want to present our values. We want to make sure people know what our values are and our foundation and our beliefs, so then we can present a solution. So I said, so what are your values? What do they stand on? And who, and the three counselors who were in there as well were like, well. We just got to make sure they get across, you know. And I said, "Well, what are they?" You know. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, he just like the head counselor he runs the whole department, and he deals with like that over fifteen thousand you know students every year with mental health problems. And I said, "Was talking a little bit about <laughs> and Bhakti inspired about the root of the problem and things." And he was like, "No, I don't think it's that. Um, I just think the problem is that you know we've got so many people coming in and um, not enough counselors." And we just needed to um, deal with the symptoms at the moment. So it was quite interesting because I also worked in the Hall of Residence with 18 year olds, um, first year at university. And there was like several suicide attempts this year at 18 years old that I was kind of was helping out with. Um, and most of them just had no idea like that they were not more than just their line. So that was quite interesting to talk to them a little about that. Shisha Prabhu, final comments? I was just wondering what the um, filmmaker's angle was, because they had a lot of um, vistas of the city where there are very prominent church steeples and um, bell towers and things like that. Um, were they trying to comment that maybe some kind of religious religiousness should be brought back into uh, Belgium, which is a pretty secular country? Um, one is they, if they were suggesting that that's what they thought the answer was. Um, and I wonder, is that opposed to what you're saying in terms of Viewing it, the uh, applied spiritual technology, viewing it in just a, a knowledge angle. Is that enough, just the knowledge, or does some religiosity have to be mixed in to the ultimate solution for these people? <laughs> <laughs> I like Srila Prabhupada's answer. That's, sometimes he would say, we're not actually religious. We're about education, culture, transformation. Uh, religious sentiment is becoming more and more out of favor. Religious sentiment is something, but it is something there's the way the contemporary mindset works in many countries of the world other than the USA. Uh, religious sentiment just, it just doesn't do it for people anymore. You gotta believe in God and you shouldn't sin. How many of you here were motivated by that as kids? <laughs> We have a couple of choir boys here. <laughs> and how long did it last? <laughs> We're actually looking at the failure of religious sentiment. Mere religious sentiment doesn't keep societies from going off the cliff, as you see. So that point we want to make. Religious sentiment is nice, but not enough to transform lives effectively in such a way that people are protected from the loose energy and making spiritual advancement out of material existence. 
So we respect religions, but we also point out that they are not at all effective. It's like I was reading today, one prominent Christian theologian, he wrote an editorial in the New York Times, and he was pointing out the unique gift of Christianity to the world, and of course we accept Jesus Christ as representative of the Supreme. But it, this theologian was pointing out the uniqueness of the contribution that by Jesus pointing out the sufferings of other human beings, the poor, the imprisoned, the sick, he brought value to the human experience and he put the sufferings of human existence in the spotlight so that humans would value each other. And he kept saying over and over again, humans, humans, humans. Uh, what about the other living animals? Don't they fit into the picture? What about all species of life? What about the sufferings of other creatures? So again, we respect religious sentiment, but we also, from the therapeutic point of view, don't think it's very effective. How's that? <laughs> as long as you approve. We <laughs> very ominous that uh, such laws have been passed because it's just one step further to governments or some people deciding that well, you should be <coughs> killed for the benefit of society rather than you want to exit society. So it's um, quite ominous that such state-sponsored death um, is as loud as, as you said. And the submarine keeps getting pulled down. So one legal step after another, and it's legal for abortion, and it's legal for euthanasia, and it's legal for other types of cleansing and such in society. Very, very ominous situation of the material world. <coughs> Time for some joyful chanting and dance. <laughs> so I hope you can understand that yes, we have joyful chanting and dancing, but we are not a, we are not like rabbits with the eyes closed to the problems of the world. We fully are in tune with the problems of the world, and we're able to distinguish between what is a real solution and what's a false solution. And that solution is not based on religious sentiment, it's actually based on applied spiritual technology, genuine spiritual therapy, in which first is realization that you're different from the body and mind. And then you can see all living entities, all creatures, as having the spirit soul, not just human beings, not just compassion for human beings, which is a great step forward to have compassion for human beings, but the vision that Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita is infinitely more compassionate. And then again, why blind yourself with the vision that life is only on earth planet? Life's only on the earth planet and only human beings are to be valued. So restrictive. The past few years, there's been a big academic conference at Cambridge University in which top named scientists in the world have concluded 
And it's time to let people know animals have consciousness. <laughs> And then they went and had their banquet of animal play. <laughs> so our bhakti vision is the most healthy, it's the most holistic, it's the most therapeutic, and it's the most joyful. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.